Okay, welcome very much in the audience. And uh, guest here for this segment is a dear friend of mine and the world, and that's Norton Mizvinsky. He's been long a distinguished professor of Middle East uh, concern uh, in the University in, Co uh, in Connecticut, and he's also another president of the International State Council for Middle East Studies. International Council for Middle East studies, a relatively new entity in Washington, and he's involved with that. He's very involved uh, intimately with uh, Israeli issues, arguing from a perspective that included both Israel Shahak and Elmer Berger uh, in terms of his own thinking, but also the country of Syria. And Norton, always so very good to see you. Welcome to Conversation. Thank you. It's good to be here again, Harold. Now, I know you're going to be, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about uh, Syria and things. That you, I think you're going to be off to that. In I'm a going of off weeks. to Syria soon. But you said specifically, again. you would like to address on this 58-minute uh, program uh, the Israeli situation or the way you see things there. And I wonder maybe you could just, as they say, take it away, pick up on it, and uh, tell me what it is that's on your mind, young man, at this uh, November, what is this, uh, July, what is it, 21st? It's very nice of you to say young man. Thank you. I'm glad with. to hear it every time I do, too. <laughs> but unfortunately, it's disappearing like gone with the wind. But Well, the Arab-Israeli conflict, really, it's more specifically the Palestinian-Israeli or Israeli-Palestinian yeah. conflict is in many ways worse than ever. Really? And it's in many ways worse than ever um, uh, to a great extent because uh, after these um, uh, 63 years, uh, it has not been settled and um, there are not even serious negotiations that are going on or that are even planned. Mm -hmm. Because of that, as you probably know, uh, the um, uh, Palestinian political leadership, or at least part of it, mm -hmm. under Mahmoud Abbas, mm -hmm. plan uh, within the context of the Arab League to bring a proposal to the General Assembly of the United Nations in September or early October, mm -hmm. uh, a proposal. They're going to propose a resolution that uh, the United Nations recognize an independent sovereign state of Palestine. Mm -hmm. Now, the Israelis are totally against that being done. The United States government is fully and totally as announced by President Obama, Secretary of State Clinton, and their spokespeople, is also opposed. Uh, their position is that this needs to be worked out in negotiations between the Israelis, the Israeli government, and the Palestinian leadership. But of course, the problem with that is there have been talks for decades, yeah. and the talks have gotten absolutely nowhere, mm -hmm. and we can get into the reasons why. Where was the initiative for this that's going to be this is This is a Palestinian initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Abbas? It, uh, this is Abbas, and we can come to the split in the Palestinian leadership mm -hmm. uh, as we go along in this discussion. But um, the problem, the technical problem, or the practical problem is that this is being raised in the General Assembly where a majority vote is enough to carry. But for any nation, new nation, or any nation to come into the United Nations, that has to be okayed by the Security Council. The United States has already announced that if a resolution for an independent state of Palestine with which Israel does not agree comes up in the Security Council, veto. the United Nations will veto it. The United States. On the, I, 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 yeah. That's right. The United States will veto right. it. On the other hand, mm -hmm. the Abbas leadership of the Palestinians, their reasoning is if we get the General Assembly to vote— uh, in recognition of an independent Palestinian st state, 
that helps us, mm -hmm. the Palestinians, in our movement towards the state. It also puts Israel and even perhaps the United States, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, during uh, the course of uh, Israel's history has backed Israel, as you know, almost blindly. Yeah. It puts yeah. them rather in not only in the political corner, mm -hmm. but it means that they are then standing opposed to a majority of the nations who will have, hopefully from the Palestinian point of view, mm -hmm. voted in favor of this in the General Assembly. Has this been tried by Palestinian representatives in the past? No, this is the has first this, time. Has this been tried by some other uh, entity trying to get a, a, a thing like that done in the General Assembly, perhaps from another part of the world or something? No, or not in the same way. Or is it precedent setting no, to have a thing really, No, this is really, this is precedent setting. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some other practical problems. I would think. There's an internal Palestinian practical problem, as you know. Abbas and his party, Fatah, represent only part of the Palestinian leadership. Mm -hmm. The other political leadership voted in in 2006 Hamas. Uh, is Hamas. Mm -hmm. There have been moves in the, in the recent past and really in, recent, in the last uh, uh, couple months, there have been attempts for Hamas and Fatah to reunite with one another, but that has not come about. Uh, because of some internal fights over uh, some of the people who would be involved in this um, uh, uh, cooperative kind of Palestinian government. That's a problem. On the other hand, the Hamas leadership, or at least most of the Hamas leadership, favors the move to have a declaration that passes the General Assembly for an independent Palestinian state. This would be a precedent-setting thing? It would be precedent-setting, but the point is we also don't know yet what will be proposed as the boundaries of that state. Well, that's one thing. That's one thing. That's the detail and so forth. But the idea, I'm, I'm just not familiar with the way the, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole United Nation works, because it, 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 you have a resolution, there's no one ever tried to do that where something could get in, even knowing there's going to be a veto by one of the great powers in the Security Council, that resolutions, no, not that are, I know of. resolutions not are passed within the General Assembly. I don't even quite know how it works. There are many resolutions that, are, that have been passed. There are tens if not hundreds of would. resolutions passed not only by the General Assembly, but sometimes even passed by the Security Council mm -hmm. that have not ever been enforced by but, the United Nations. So it's not present if there are these resolutions are passed within the General Assembly on a regular basis, what is it that makes the one that you're suggesting from Abbas uh, precedence? Uh, well, I don't, no, it, it's, it's no, a no, thing there have not done. been, there have been resolutions passed, mm -hmm. but not like this. And let me give you, if the question would be, if the question would be, well, what value is there to this? I can answer that by giving an analogy. Well, I can give perhaps an answer right. by giving right. an analogy. Right. 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 On November 29th, 1947, mm -hmm. the United Nations, of course, the whole of the United, the United Nations passed a resolution recommending that the state of Israel as the Zionists wanted it would come into existence. Now many people say that the United Nations therefore and thereby created the state of Israel. That's technically incorrect because the United Nations has never been empowered to create states. What the United Nations can do is what happened here, November 29, 1947. It can recommend that a, that a certain state or kind of state come into existence. Mm -hmm. And if, we'll say, there's a majority vote in the General Assembly, uh -huh. that means there is international recognition, and that could be of political value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, 
here you can say there's something analogous. The Palestinian leadership believes that if they bring it in the General Assembly, regardless of the Security Council, and the resolution is passed, mm -hmm. then their argument is we have international recognition for an independent, sovereign Palestinian state, which we want, which we want. So that's the argument about what a potential advantage might be. How advantageous that would be, as I suggested previously, mm -hmm. in a practical sense, yeah. that's another matter altogether. Right, right. I mean, right. I yeah. personally don't think it's going to be. Um, even if it works, isn't it? Well, even it if it's some passive. It has PR value or something. Well, like, yes, you know, and then, and uh, it means that then the Israeli position and the United States position are opposed to a majority decision of the nations in the United Nations. Will that be helpful? We have a phrase in Yiddish, gut based God right. knows. That's <laughs> yeah, a phrase right. you like. I you know? like that, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I um, get that. Oh, with regularity with, with Vinci on the set. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. 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 It's because of my background. I though. know that. You have a oh. great eye. Ames, Iowa, the only. Uh, yeah. Well. yeah, anyway. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. all right. That's <clears throat> that's a current thing. But as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. uh, this Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, is really bad mm -hmm. uh, because there's been no progress. The Israeli government continues consistently to um, take over more Palestinian land yeah, in various ways mm. in the West Bank. You see a Gaza stomach. is yeah. still troublesome. Yeah. Uh, and even within Israel before June 1967, Israel within those borders, the 1.3 to 1.4 million Palestinians who live there who are citizens, they are at best second class citizens, uh -huh. which means mm -hmm. by law, mm -hmm. by law, yeah. they do not have all the rights and privileges that Jewish citizens have, right. which of course then raises an enormous issue. Mm -hmm. And the enormous issue is how democratic can any state be when that state has laws passed by its legislature with nothing above the law, and no those laws, no constitution, and those laws give certain rights and privileges to one group of, of citizens, not given to another group of citizens. Yeah. My answer is that cannot be termed a democratic state, although we hear he, in the United thing. States every day, and we read every day in our media, or almost every day, that Israel is not only a democratic state, mm -hmm. that it's the most democratic state in the Middle East. And the only, perhaps. And the here. only one. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, what I'm suggesting here, Israel cannot be what the Israeli government, what the Declaration of Independence of Israel says, what the laws say, and what a majority of the Jewish citizens say. Israel cannot be a Jewish state guaranteeing rights and privileges to Jews, not guaranteed to others, even those who are citizens, and at the same time be a democratic state. Either you have a Jewish state, which is not a democratic state, or you have a democratic state. The argument that it's Jewish and democratic at the same time, well, uh, that is... Non sequitur. Th that's right. Yeah, I yeah. would say it's mm -hmm. a ridiculous argument. And that's all very interesting and everything. A couple things come to mind. First, uh, that kind of a thing, was a pro the term apartheid was a pro was the case of South Africa that we remember. That's a term that could be applied. But also, I wonder in a practical sense, uh, if you're talking about, and I understand, and I agree with you, and it's a big, interesting question, but um, in a practical sense, we don't have uh, a democracy in real terms, in terms of the way, I mean, we, we, we don't, I think they ought to stop saying that we have a democracy anywhere because you don't. You have an inordinate power base of uh, people who have a vested interest in the established order. 
it's almost as though uh, if you if you meld it with economics and so forth, the capital assets are all owned by a tiny plutocratic class in every country of the world. The international order is not democratic, it's plutocratic. And we ought to recognize that. It's the case in everywhere. So the idea of democracy is a chimera or a thing that we, a real democracy that is meaningful democracy in people's lives is a chimera that's maybe in the distance there, maybe, or something, but it doesn't exist. It never has, even in, empirically in Greece. Well, it's I, just an idea of certain institutions to, uh, to cover up for the gross, gross historic long inequity within the world organization of human society. I mean, it's just That may be, Harold, but I think that we also have to consider a couple other things. Mm -hmm. One is that it's relative. That is to say, there are some places, well, some places are different than other places. Some have some, some countries are different than other countries. So they have an institution. There is also, yeah. there is also, there's also mm. a difference between what the stated or written by law, by constitution, public policy is and what the practice is. Now, if we're talking yeah, about everywhere, yeah. everywhere yeah. now, if we're, we know, for example, we certainly know that in the United States that the practice is oftentimes at variance with the public policy. But I'm saying that when I look at the state of Israel, and I think this is the major problem, mm -hmm. there, what makes it, I would suggest, even worse, mm -hmm. is that the public policy itself is anti-democratic. Mm -hmm. Nothing above the law, as I said. And again, there are the laws, mm -hmm. and yeah. these laws that guarantee rights and privileges to Jewish citizens, mm -hmm. not guaranteed and not given to even other citizens who are not Jewish, right. that means the public <laughs> policy mm. is opposed to democracy. I did a program that aired last week from when this will air with Israel Shayak, and he said in there, you have a thing, a state for the Jews, and if it had been the founding of the United States of America, they could have said, this is a country only for high Episcopals. You know, high, high Anglican. Yeah. And that's all there are. And that's the only thing that's going to have the rights. And they do. Essentially, that's the case in each case. You have a, an order that's in place and everything. But to say, uh, you know, or, or, or Protestant even, only Protestants would be that was the thing, that was the thing. So that doesn't sort of work very well in terms of, uh, you know, here you got 189 countries representing New York City itself. Here, everybody's here. And it doesn't mean only the established order no, of a certain, pertinent, pertinent, uh, a certain or, uh, moment in history are going to be allowed to have the citizens' rights and not. But it all masks the fact that the whole thing is not, there's not real, honest to God, liberating democracy anywhere, nor has there ever been. That's the only point I'm trying to make. It's a chimera and ways of rationalizing unjust systems that are intrinsic to the whole world and the order that is not adequate to what the future requires. We're in a time of transformation. That may be, but yeah. of course, I would still suggest again that it also is relative. Okay, good. That is, some right. places are far worse than other places. Okay. And let yeah. me say what I've pointed out here about the difference in Israel mm -hmm. between a Jewish state, mm -hmm. quote unquote, and a democratic state, mm -hmm. that is not just something that's been observed commented upon and criticized mm -hmm. by, uh, we'll say, uh, uh, people who um, are to what I'll call the Israeli left. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm reminded that when Meyer Kahana was alive, yeah, right. who certainly that's... was mm -hmm. uh, an extreme person right. on the other side, right. Meyer Kahana continually said and wrote, he has a whole book devoted yeah. to this, that Israel is not, was not intended to be, cannot be, and should not be both a democratic state and a Jewish state. Well, he said and he like, criticized all the Zionist leaders for saying so. Uh -huh. And then he said... No, he, he said that. 
he that was that that's what he observed yeah. and he criticized Zionist leaders for saying it was Jewish and democratic and then he said Jews need to choose and of course from Meyer Kahana's point of view they should choose a Jewish state not a democratic state what I'm saying is that his whole logic was right yeah. except the choice should be just the opposite yeah right they should choose a more a more democratic state was it was that in that vein of thinking or 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 stern listen, gang and all of the all, listen all uh, not uh, Jabotinsky, yes yeah but all of the Zionist including leaders including Ben Gurion and all, all of the Zionist yeah. leaders yeah. which of course i believe points out what the basic problem of this conflict is and we don't get enough attention to this, especially mm. in the United States. Right. The basic problem mm. is the Zionist character of the state of Israel. Mm. It's the Zionist character. It's the character, it's this state that exists within this framework that does do what I just said. Mm. It's not democratic. It gives rights and privileges to Jews not given to others. Now, I think there is a, the, there's a, there's a, there's a moral consideration that perhaps should come first, mm. but there's a major practical consideration that makes this a big conflict uh -huh. because of where it is. Yeah, okay. Saudi Arabia, is also an exclusive state. It's an Islamic state. Right. Now, morally, I'm as opposed, maybe even more opposed yeah. because it's more extreme, yeah. to the kind of state Saudi Arabia is, it's an exclusive state, mm -hmm. as I am to Israel's being a Jewish state. Mm -hmm. But there's a practical difference. Well over 85 or 86 percent of all the people in the Middle East and probably closer to 90% are Muslims. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe, not quite 2% mm -hmm. of all the people mm -hmm. are Jews. Mm -hmm. So a state that grants rights and privileges to Muslims, not granted to other people, is discriminating against maybe 10% of the people in the area. Mm -hmm. The state that gives rights and privileges to Jews, mm -hmm. not given to others, is discriminating against 98 plus percent. Mm -hmm. And that means there's no question in my mind, conflict that will exist as long as in that area you have that kind of situation. <clears throat> yeah, that, is, that would be historically untenable. In a longer term perspective. That's a practical yeah, consideration. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I, again, I want to emphasize that it's the moral yeah. criticism that comes first. Yeah, yeah. But that's a, and that's why I say this is the basic problem, mm -hmm. and this is the basic problem, and it's not just that there are laws that discriminate, mm -hmm. it's that the Palestinians the people who, who constitute the indigenous population or most of the indigenous population, mm -hmm. they have been discriminated against and they have been oppressed consistently and mm -hmm. continually mm -hmm. as long as the state of Israel has existed. Uh -huh. Now, when that happens, there is bound to be conflict. Okay, it set that up. What I wonder what those figures are because I, I don't know... Uh, the United States has been uh, almost unendingly supportive of Israel over the long haul. Made it, we're connected at the economically, hip. Politically, politically, and militarily, and particularly more recently, it's there. So, what does it say with this that you're saying uh, that we are supportive of that? I mean, you do have a thing called realpolitik. If you've got the Gatling gun, you can you can conquer the Hindu nations with your advanced weapons and you have a weapon system to intimidate, that's real politique in a lot of ways, where people have the ability to do it. Yeah. But what does it say that we've joined uh, on the si that side of things, that apartheid side of things in terms of the region, that we've adjoined to it, and how is it interpreted as being in our long-term interest in a world where uh, more and more uh, a say over things is being invested to people who've previously been marginalized, it's like not, it, the Arab nation it, writ it, large, it, or Africa, or other parts of the world. Why have we tied in? Well, uh, let me divide the question. One is, has this support for Israel really been 
um, within the interest of the United States Thank and the you. United States George government. Ball didn't yeah. think so. I would, say, I would say no. I yeah. mean, no yeah. matter how you look at it. Yeah. If you look at it in terms of area, if you look at it in terms of population, if you look at it in terms of trade, or if you look at it as, of course, many people look at it, mm. many people in the government, mm. if you look at it in terms of oil mm -hmm. and oil supply, mm -hmm. that doesn't exist within the state of Israel. That's in the Arab Gulf mm -hmm. plus, and that's two-thirds of the known oil reserves in the whole of the world. Which is so, strategically extremely which is, important. That's right. And you talk about real politique, well. that certainly is an element in, in well, we would now. be seeming we would seemingly be running against our interests in terms of yes. realpolitik in that vein but then what they'd have to say is but there's a higher moral question and no, we, we are, are no. the democracy we represent the enlightenment we represent the future we are the legitimate authority historically and that we have a higher moral order that we're answering to rather than just mere geopolitics and you know that's, you understand what I'm saying? Um, uh, well, all of that. White man's burden. Right. In a that's certain right. Sense. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what you're suggesting mm -hmm. is all of that mm -hmm. is the argument that. <laughs> that's what comes from political leaders in the United yeah. States. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of other people think, even though beyond Arab-Israeli conflict, mm -hmm. uh, we can think of many, many examples mm -hmm. of where those high principles mm -hmm. have not held mm -hmm. and do not hold. Right, right. But right. all right. But mm -hmm. back to the interests of the United States. Yeah. Now, but what one U.S. government after another has been able to do, mm -hmm. but now it's become more difficult. One government after another has been able to support Israel fully and totally, to have some antagonism directed against it from the Arab Middle East, but still the United States has to date fared well overall in terms of maintaining its position and maintaining its oil supply from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that that necessarily needs to continue mm -hmm. or will continue, mm -hmm. and I think that it may not. The point is, however, that it, support of Israel is not really within the interest of the United States. There are, so then the question is, why then mm -hmm. has there been that support? I was about to leap to ask you that very All question. All right. Now, that's, that's the next thing. Now, there are two major answers that are given. Two. One of them is, and, I, and some people that I greatly respect put this answer. One answer is that... One United States government after another since 48, and especially since 1967, they have viewed Israel and made Israel into the nation that the United States can count upon in the Middle East. Right. Can count upon that that the that's United our Fort Apache. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> that's yeah. that's yeah, that's, it. Yeah. that's one argument. Mm. Now before I get to the second argument, mm -hmm. let me tell you why I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. Even though as I say you can there, make the argument. there are people that I greatly respect mm -hmm. who put the argument. Yeah. Let me give just one illustrative example. Mm -hmm. I think that the, I and the, or others can give many more. Mm -hmm. If I go back to Desert Storm oh, at the wow. beginning yeah. of the 1990s, Glad the first time we went into, mm -hmm. uh, well, we went in against, uh, against Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis, we went into Kuwait, we moved more troops into that area. It wasn't much of a war, mm -hmm. but we moved more troops the into Turkey that area troops. than we had moved up yeah. to that time. Yeah. Uh, anywhere in the world since the end of World War II. Yeah, that's true. When we did yeah. that, yeah. and so on, what did the United States government say to the Israelis, Suppose, supposedly our big ally in terms of trouble? We told the Israeli government, don't do anything and don't even say anything, because if you say something, that may disturb our Arab allies in this fight. Uh -huh. So my question is, what kind of ally is that? Mm -hmm. what, uh, for, uh, uh, it seems to me only rational mm -hmm. that that undercuts this whole argument. Uh -huh. So now there's a second argument. Okay. Yeah. And the second argument, 
which is difficult to believe unless one has studied the evidence. The evidence makes it clear. The second argument is the United States has been that way because of the operation in this country of, I would say, two major lobbies. Two APAC, major lobbies. Yeah. One is the Israel lobby, that's the Ameri headed by the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, mm -hmm. APAC. Mm, and powerful. some yeah. people, yes, some people call that the Jewish lobby. Mm. That's not a correct name, even though the members are Jews, mm. but uh, uh, that doesn't represent all the Jews in the United States. No. That's an Israel lobby. Mm. Okay. And uh, they have <coughs> been very powerful in what they've done. Mm. That's one lobby. The other lobby that's I would say in the last decade, become as important, as influential, and even more influential what? is the Christian Zionist oh, lobby. Oh, wow, yeah. The okay, Christian yeah. Zionist. Uh -huh, now, uh -huh, uh -huh. here we're talking mm. about, here, here I'm talking about Christian Zionists who are evangelicals. And at some point, we might do a whole program on Christian We've done Zionism. We've some in the past. That's about right. It. It's that's really right. serious. Now, yeah, yeah. It, and that's really serious because of. How, of what they do and how many they represent. I remember a few years ago, before he died, Jerry Falwell, one of the leaders, one of the Christian Zionist leaders, he said on television, he wrote, he said it on the radio, he made his speeches, and he said, we, we being the Christian Zionist leaders, we represent 100 million Americans. Mm. Now, I can tell you from the study I've done, and I'm finishing a book now on Christian Zionism, yeah. that was an exaggeration. Mm. There aren't 100 million. About there 40, are yeah. about 40, 40 to 50 million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. 40 yeah. to 50 million. That's a main And some people Mr. would Bush say, listen, that doesn't mean that even though you can count those people in congregations and so on, that they always follow what their leaders say. Mm -hmm. that, that point is true, but only up to a certain extent. When the Christian Zionist leaders call upon their followers to send used to be telegrams and letters. Now it's emails yeah. to congressmen, to the White House, to the president, to the secretary of state. They don't get hundreds. They don't get thousands. They don't get tens of thousands. They get many, many hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. And what do they all say? They all say to their representatives, to their senators, to the president, they all say, uh, in whatever their wording Support is, Israel. you better toe the line mm. here, or in the next election, you may be voted out of office, and your opponents, and this the Israel lobby says the same, your opponents in the next election, they're likely to have, if you don't do this, two, three, four, Eight, ten, eight or ten times as much money to campaign as you do, and we know what that means. Where, we also where, where, who what they what? do it by by no, PACs. I'll, now wait, and what do and what do we really know? Yeah, we really know. I say, unfortunately, that for unfortunately, mm -hmm. most members of Congress and perhaps presidents as well. Usually, if not always, usually, their number one major concern is to be re-elected. That is, Matt that's, blows the that's level. Get right. elected, get elected, get elected. That's, that's it. Right. Yeah, right. So, Billion if dollars. they have all these threats that come in, you see mm. here, let's say mm. there's... Uh, uh, a man or a woman who's sitting as a representative in the House of Representatives of the Senate, mm -hmm. and let's say all of a sudden, there are thousands of emails that come in and they all say they're signed and they all say we're constituents. None of these people has a staff th that's large enough to check everybody out. Right. But they figure this way. They figure, you know, so far we've been able to walk the tightrope in terms of the Arab world. Mm -hmm. We're still getting our oil. Mm -hmm. We're still doing what we want. We've been able to do that. Why should I take a chance that in the next election I might be hurt, and so I'm not going to take the chance, they most decide, mm -hmm. and I'm going to vote 
for all this support for Israel. Yeah. Now I'm saying that it's like a I'm cow. saying that yeah. that is mm -hmm. probably th we get the majority of votes in Congress from those kinds of people mm -hmm. who I'm going to suggest don't really care very much about either Israeli Jews or Palestinians, but they care about getting reelected and they become convinced that maybe they'll be put in some jeopardy. Now we have a coterie, we have a small grouping, smaller grouping in Congress mm -hmm. of people who are really committed fully and totally to the Israeli cause. Well, they lead the fight but then we have the others. And let me put another political consideration right now with President Obama. We know that in terms of Obama and his policies and his economic policies, which are terribly important, mm. he needs and has needed for his whole term, he's needed 100 percent of the votes from Democratic senators in the Senate, because it's very, very close, and if he loses one or two or three of those votes, he may lose his majority, and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a number of them, not a majority of minority, a number of those Democratic senators, not even talking about the Republicans for a minute, mm -hmm. who come to him at times and they say, listen, they say things like this. I say, listen, buddy. Mm. They don't use these words, I'm no, sure. No, no, I'm but they say, listen, buddy. Mm. You either toe the line here and support Israel, or you cannot necessarily count on our votes mm. for your other policies. Mm -hmm. Now, which way is Obama going to go? Uh -huh. Well, that's the thing. And you got 40 million. That's a huge block. That's the committed. Christian Zionists. Yeah, now, then the you kids. have the Israel lobby. Yeah. And so you put those two together now. That's now. the power base of Mr. Bush. It, and we know, we know that, we or know large, how important lobbying well, you got is. Well, in, in money interests. And that, we yeah. know how important lobbying is in terms of the United States Increasingly government. Increasingly so. That's right. And from, the Street. and from the serious studies, I'm talking about academic scholarly studies mm -hmm. that have been done. This is even before the last 15 years or so when the Christian Zionist lobby became as powerful as it is. But before that, Continually in the serious studies, we were all we were told by people who did the in-depth study from good primary source material that the two most influential lobbies, the two most influential, were the big oil companies mm -hmm. and the Israel lobby, APAC. Now you add to APAC, as I already have, let's say in the last 15 to 20 years, the Christian Zionist lobby, which I've already suggested, is now just as powerful as APAC. Really? And there you have it. Oh, yes, of course. Really? Of course. Listen. It's in, hard to imagine. Oh, look at it this way. Yeah. We have, as you know, we You're have on a... the scene down there. We have, we have a... Christian Broadcasting Network, a whole television network. Yeah. Who's the head of it? Pat Robertson. Well, Who's what? Pat Rob? Well, he if was. It, isn't that uh, gone and everything? No, no it still Who's exists. Who's picking that up? I don't find it as being Listen. so influential as well, it was. I'd we see. still have Christian Zionist you lobbies. Do, that's the only thing he had Listen, on television was some evangel. Listen, and almost all of those people are the most extreme. Israeli government supporters, their, uh, their arguments, and, and they're that way, mm -hmm. they're that way. Reading the gospel. Be, uh, well, from their theological yeah. position, mm -hmm. the theological position, well, it's, it's large, but mm -hmm. the essence of it is not difficult to explain. For them, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, Jews have to have and will have control of the whole holy land. Mm -hmm. And by control, some of them mean just control. Others mean Jews have to be the total population of the holy land. And therefore and thereby, we have to support the Jewish state. Yeah. of Israel, yeah, they read and that then on their, top of it, on top of it, and verse. Yeah. on, uh, on yeah. top of it, they are extremely anti-Muslim and anti-Islamic. Mm -hmm. They're anti-Islam. Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. you have it. Yeah.
It's a frightening thought. It is, yeah. It really is. That's a, a thing that's there. And then the, the question is, again, uh, where does it lead? Uh, I, I, I didn't realize that that uh, Christian right, as you call it, that is so powerful. Terribly powerful. They used to, you're, a, you're a historian, right? They used to have a party in 19th century America called the Know Nothing Party. Yes, that's right. But it the was point called is, the New Republican yes, Party. But you it see, was called in the initial stages. Yeah, but listen, but these Christian Zionists, yeah. they're a lot smarter than to try to have a political party of their own. Well, it doesn't sound to me, if I may, with all due respect, being an, uh, intellectually inclined and everything, I don't think all those uh, stories out of the myths of history that are being repaired to by those people, that's not being done by intellectuals. That's being done by people that could be, could be associated with outdated religious ideas that are fairy tales. Listen, Harold, fairy tales. Harold, Harold, that may well there be. There was no exodus from, Lib from Egypt, uh, Mr. Shlomo Sand shows. Intellectuals do not go by fairy tales well, like, the, wait like your Christian right well, is wait, doing. No, not only, no, it's not only Christian writers. They're, not, they're clever, but they're wait not a minute, intellectual. No, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. There are devout Christians who believe this stuff, and there are, of course, a lot of devout Jews. Now, there is the issue you raise about, listen, how valid is all of that? You're right. We don't have historical evidence. You mentioned Shlomo Sand and his book, The Invention of the Jewish People. I know you had him on recently. Yeah, great guy. And yeah. I mean, that's right. And it's, it's he points tale. out, wait, wait, wait. Yes, and there are a good many people who believe that. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, now, but I'm saying two things. One, that's not the fact that th that may be true. <laughs> right. The right. fact that that may be well, true. Well, you use the word that's intelligent. Not, that's, wait, wait, I'll, call, I'll come brief. to intelligence yeah. in a minute. Okay. That, that may be true, mm -hmm. may be true. Mm -hmm. But what's really relevant here is that we have a great majority of the population of the United States, and we're talking about the United States, who believe these things that you're calling fairy tales. Yeah, right. And they yeah. act on those well, things. Well, I didn't say it's no. only the real and Christian. So, and I so, would say no. there's a great wait. deal okay. of ignorance of no. You got this Tea Party thing coming, wait. and it's coming off all kinds of, it's like, no, that's why I like the no nothing. It's like ignorance. Yes, but wait, And Harold. also, I wonder if there's a, uh, we did a thing where we discussed the thing about the Jewish uh, thing in the world. The Jewish people, I do not know, in terms of the traditions of the broader Jewish community, what's not to like? They have a tremendous sense of uh, justice. They have a sense, as a group, they have a tremendous sense of social concern with things that really, really matter. They have contributed overwhelmingly intellectually to the advancement of the human society. What's not to like? And is the idea of anti uh, Zion, say Zionism, you conflate Zionism with Judaism, is anti-Semitism and into a, 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 uh, a know-nothing uh, attack against, against, um, against, against, against intelligence well, wait. Or, or against anti-intellectual bias that is abroad in the world. Well, wait, Harold, but let's... Do you understand? Let's take two of these points that you raised. One is, first of all, the business about fairy tales and no one who believes that those, those biblical stories can be intelligent. Well, as well, a matter of fact, we have had in history and we do have today a great many people who, from any reasonable perspective, are enormously intelligent who do believe this stuff. Well, no, not only that. No. no, I would grant further, oh. Norton, if I may. They would be able to study it in great, uh, I mean, all of the Talmudic scholars and so forth, they could study it in great detail and, 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 and use a lot of intellectual energy trying to parse out all the implications and all of that. It would be an intellectual thing. It's been characteristic of okay. much of humanity so, number one, coming out of a dark age of ignorance. Well, where they've had to have well, some sort of thing that did that. We're well, coming to a new saying is, all I'm saying is that we have intelligent people who do believe this, but, 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 
most of them would also say that there is a difference, when we know there is, between a religious belief and something that is proven or near proven by historical evidence in this world. And you're suggesting... Not only history, yeah, the Enlightenment. There yeah, okay, was an Enlightenment. Okay, there was, that's all true. Yeah. That, but I'm saying, that's, wait, that's yeah. one thing. But now, let me come to your comment about Jewish people. Now, if we're talking about, we could be talking about Jews in the United States, about six million. We could be talking about Jews in most parts of the world. How many Jews are there in the whole world? We don't have an exact count. Somewhere between 14 and 16 million. Right, Not very it. many yeah. when you think about Christians and Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now. I would say to you that the things you pointed out that are positive, and of course I am um, uh, more than happy about this, I <laughs> yeah. mean, since I'm a Jew, yeah, I mean, yeah. okay. Those things are true, I would say, but there is one area of exception for some numbers of those Jews, and we don't know the exact numbers. And that area of exception is the state of Israel and Zionism. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. when they support the kinds of things they support in that state, a state that oppresses unduly the indigenous population, then I'm saying that go, that's an exception to the positive things that you outlined. Well, no, they would be able to rationalize. There's all kinds of ways in which you can rationalize. Uh, I like James Joyce saying history is a nightmare of injustice by which the leading lights of the time can rationalize how one group is better than another. They can do that. That's what it is. That's what we did. We had all kinds of apologists for stealing all the land of the Amer Indian peoples. We had slavery. We had all kinds of institutions. Aristotle said it was a slave system, Pericles in Greece. It's always been a few people who will apologize for the fact that some people have all the control and other people are like slaves. Yes, Harold. Stuff. Somebody had to make some rationalization for how it's proper for that chattel slavery system to be in place or that serfdom to be in but place. Listen. And for us to own everything and to us to have something that benefits us and and to rationalize it all a lot of it's done in legal terms a lot of it's done in other terms philosophical to uh, Hitler tried to add his house offer to say it's the Aryans that are the best but that Harold, kind of thing's part of history yeah. which is a nightmare of injustice. yes but Harold it's what I Harold what I'm trying to we point out also what I'm trying to point out is that the apologia mm. and the rationale yeah. that you're talking about yeah. cannot in any way whatsoever, in any rational way, can that be put within the context of or equated with social justice, the term that you put when you were talking about what is there to like in regard to Jews. Okay, that's you can have an apologia, you can have a rationale, yeah. but you can't reconcile that with social justice. Well, I would justice. think there might be some conflict roiling in the hearts of a lot of Jewish people who have a strong, because they, they have a commitment to justice. They have a commitment to social. That, so I think there has to be uh, Oh, there are conflict. plenty that are that way. There has to be conflict. But what I'm saying, what I'm trying to relate it to is a broader uh, uh, problem, and that being is we don't have vision of a qualitative transformation uh, at this time. That's the thing that really is so disturbing uh, that we don't have. We have now, and I don't know, chapter and verse, you know history. I was going to ask you, the Know Nothing Party. I'm sure there was something there. There was something to it. But the, the worshiping of uh, outdated institutions and ignorance and so forth, uh, it took, explain this to me as a, as a person of intelligence, that uh, Galileo Copernicus, when they said we're not the center of the universe, messed up really hard with the means by which people got a sense of identity, that we were the center of the universe, Hieronymus Bosch, paintings of utter discord and upset, and, every, and they only let him off the hook, the Catholic Church, about 12 years ago for stating, which was obviously a case which we had from the discovery of the telescopes, the new realities. We have understandings of it. We're now in an age, in a time, 
and I, I remember that Isaac Asimov, God bless me, did a program, and we now know things. We're waking up. We're not just having to rely upon the old, outdated institutions that are coming out of history. And he said, this is the defining generation. And that we have weapon systems now, extensions of consciousness. I make this point. The weapon systems have become, only by about 1970, I wondered about you saying the troops in, uh, they, they had a lot of troops in, uh, in Vietnam. Cool. You said after the Second World War in terms of the, you know, the Iraq. But anyway, never mind that. But the weapons have become species lethal at a level of capability. The level of capability has just moved us existentially into a whole new relationship in the universe. If there are weapon systems and they're black ops now and they're things that are going on other things, that if there is an irration, irrational exchange of hatred and so forth, they're unleashed. Apparently, unlike all of history, we could destroy the entire species. The only thing that could manage that. There's no natural force that could do that. On the other side, we have a capability of providing for everybody in a way that we haven't had. There are technologies that are coming, uh, extensions of consciousness. We have an ability to take care of everybody and the ecology in a reasonable, intelligent order that is also there, resonatingly there, as a potential, being blocked by our insistence upon reifying all the outdated institutions we had to live with. We may have transcended material scarcity at the level of capability, never mentioned. All right, here Never are. comes up. There's an anti-intellectualism abroad that is very dangerous, one aspect of which might be worthy of taking into account. We need some vision of what's going on in a new way, and our intellectuals are falling down on the job, and maybe because they're being attacked by all these retrograde, anti-intellectual forces abroad in the world, one of which might be these ideas of Zionism. Others are also abroad, there are, there, all over Her the place. Harold, there are, so it's there, a broader issue. It, it, there's no question that it's a broader issue, and if I can comment for a moment on that broader issue. You pointed out two things that are definitely correct, one here and one here, one on one side and one on the other side. And one hand one, and on the okay, other side. That's yeah. right. Yeah. One is what we have now in terms of knowledge and what that gives us as a positive potential to take care of worldly problems and uh, that have and in human a qualitative no, no wait a no, minute no, wait a minute in a, in a qualitative yes, that's right. new way that's on the that's on the one side mm -hmm. all right on the other side on the other side we have the weaponry which means there's the ability to destroy the whole world and not we, the whole world but humanity or, uh, hum apparently humanity okay uh, apparently mm -hmm. and we have lots of other negative things that are going on. We have, uh, we have uh, on the one hand and on the other hand. Yeah. Now, let me, uh, I want to cite what I remember so many years ago when I was in graduate school, mm. that a major European historian, um, where I was getting my PhD, yeah. used to tell all the students. And he used to tell the administration too. He used to say that he refused to teach any course in history after 1789, because he said civilization ended in 1789. Ended. Now, ended. Okay. now, and okay. he said, uh -huh. and he said, the reason is for him, uh -huh. he understood on the one hand and on the other hand, uh -huh. but he said that on the other hand, the negative was so overwhelming, realistically and potentially, that he said, even with all these positive things, civilization has declined significantly after 1789. Who is I, Wait a minute, wait. I'm not putting his argument necessarily, no, I but I'm saying there's something to think about when you think not only of what the potential is mm -hmm. to destroy, as you put it, all or almost all of humanity, but when you think of, let's take recently, recently being the last century Mm -hmm. recently being the last 50 to 60 to 70 years. Last week. Or, or, or when you think of all
all of the people killed mm -hmm. and all of the people oppressed and being oppressed and all of the hunger right. and all of the negative right. things, right. you can make a pretty good case mm -hmm. that civilization has consistently declined for some long time period. Well, I don't. I'm think, not making the no, argument. I understand that. I don't buy it. I mean, it doesn't. You don't buy it. You could do. James Joyce said, "History is a nightmare." from which we're attempting to awaken. Whether we're awakening or not is there, but evolution, evolution and knowledge, and I'm making a case for the, for the lack of the ability for us to understand the, you have to go to evolution. He said 1978 in the Constitution. No, There's that's something just, about that. What was it, 1789? He picked that year. I'm not concerned oh, with the year. Well, that would year. be the Enlightenment. You that, that's and correct. All that, yeah. I, I'm not concerned with uh, the specific date that he picked. He said I'm, more, that, I'm well, just saying that 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 his argument was that not just in recent years but in recent centuries yeah. civilization has become more negative rather than positive. Well, that's something that might be seen. And also what's happened is that in evolution, when you do that, you have steady state, there will be a steady state situation. We're there, whether we like it or not, we're at a point where all of the injustices are there, the institutions are there, but existentially there's a new quality. And you have in evolution, you have what is called punctuated equilibrium. That is, you have a transformation, qualitative, paradigm of paradigm, paradigm. There was a major one in the historical period, uh, the revolution. We are going through a revolution of revolution, and it is absolutely this generation, this time, is the defining one. This is the defining generation whether we are either going to join entropy, join entropy, or move to a level. And one of the qualities of that would be, one of the qualities of the positive scene of evolutionary development, including extended consciousness, is the ability to provide to where we've transcended at the level of capability with nanotechnology, things coming where it, material scarcity is an ontologic reality. That it is, we are living in a world that we've been wandering for 40 years, since about 70 years, with no vision of the fact that we're about to come into a new relationship. And well, it's not brought up in anything other than teams reifying outdated institutions that only get in the, it's an anti-intellectual bias abroad. It's in the ac academy. They're all divided up into specializations. They can't see things in a systems way. CIA won't talk to the uh, uh, DIA. They won't talk to the, you know, the FBI. The the intelligence. They can't get unity between everything in a systems way because they're all tunnel vision, divided up and conquered. The intellectual community is innocuous in terms of bringing any kind of comprehensive understanding, and it's anti-intellectual. It's an anti-intellectual bias where everybody's coiled up in their own little cocoon which isn't su suitable to what's needed. What we need is systems understanding of what's going on in terms of this broader level. Right. And we may be coming to a new level. It's either annihilate or eliminate the whole evolutionary process of consciousness. It's never brought up. All right, Harold, that may well be so, but let me tell you that I do have some hesitation. <laughs> Wait a minute. I do have some hes hes he hesitation in accepting that at any given point in time, right now, or 50 years ago, or 50 years from now, that any given point in time, that that is the reckoning time. Well, I don't think we've we, had a lot of people tell us for a very long time that this is yeah, the reckoning point. They were wrong. They were projecting so, it. But maybe, no, know, maybe no, they used to tell us it was four. The Jews say it's five thousand seven hundred years ago the Earth got started. They have late, five they have seven all, seven yeah, yeah. one. But it's that they have these things that. Now, but now we know. We know from my, we're from science. We're two hundred thousand years. There was Australopithecine. We're part of a hominoid evolution. We know. We're now coming to the end of the human experience. 
We don't know that. Well, no, but we can project it in terms of the overall existential reality in which we are, which is brand new since about 1970. We've been wandering in the wilderness with no addressing and no academic understanding of things, systems of interrelatedness of the overall Maybe system. that's true, but maybe it's also true that 300 years from now, past your time period, there will be another Harold Channer and there will be another Norton Mesvinsky well, and they'll be be sitting uh, doing whatever the television program of the time is and there will be the same <laughs> argument that's what there is evidence. That's where the intellectual experience is leading. Every day is a revolution from every field's coming in now. It's like a quickening in a pregnancy. It's a, the water's going to break, and we have to have that. And I so, would only caution you I'm here worried at the about, end. And they're going to blow the whole wait, thing. What yes, are they dropping maybe, predators wait, on Libya? Yes, Why are they minute, dropping predators minute, all over the place? They I'm have only no vision. Saying, I'm only saying that I have some reservations about <laughs> accepting that we are now in a nine-month pregnancy or the equivalent Is of a pregnancy. Well, actually, we might be, but we might not be. But we have understanding of how that does fit. I mean, uh, we, we know now we're awakening from that. We've only had ignorance. And there's people who celebrate the ignorance and the special, and we're so used we to agree seeing on human that. nature. How can you see human nature as inherently selfish? And all of the things where you go conquer and do this and all that, when you have a situation that is qualitatively transformed. It's not ever brought up, it should be. Norton, thank, thank you. Thank you. It's good talking to you, and let's keep <laughs> laughing and everything, and God bless Mel Brooks and Woody Allen for bringing the humor among everything else. Well, that's right. And yeah. you see, uh, I'm always happy when I can have a conversation with Harold Channer, and I get Harold Channer very excited. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, Thanks a lot for you. We'll be coming back. I think we've run over time, but that's it. Okay. So uh, we're coming back again tomorrow. Tune in then. Thank you very much for viewing. Uh, okay. Well, I didn't mean to. Okay. I don't know how much that'll get on YouTube anyway. So.